Good morning, Faith Assembly. It's an exciting morning this morning with the kids and, and with the Easter egg hunt. We're so excited. But, you know, it's, I, I think it's so neat that God can use something foolish like that. But it, it works for us, amen? And God can use that. And, and we're just excited about what he's going to do in this place this morning. This first song is called Found in You. And I, and I love the part where it says, Jesus, every victory is found in you. I don't know about you, but I have found that in my life, that every, every hardship, every um, thing that to go through, I can always find my answer in the Lord. Amen? Amen. So if you can, let's please stand to our feet and let's worship the Lord and, and give him glory and honor and praise. Amen. Reaching out to welcome you, God, and fill this place again with your song, and flood our thoughts with wonder and awe, and give us a greater grace of a never-changing God. Oh!
faithfulness is walk beside me As winter springs make way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your
This life that I live is for you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes that's all we can do, right? We just thank what God is doing. What he's doing in this moment. What he's doing in our lives. What he's done to get us to here. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. The triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem 2,000 over 2,000 years ago. Crowds gathered, waving palm branches, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. John 12, 13. See, the crowds were expecting a political king. And Jesus had another thing in mind. He was not concerned in taking over the city as much as he was concerned of taking over their heart. So today, as we come and celebrate this day, which is a, a day that he willingly just stepped into, knowing that he will suffer, that he will die, one of the gruesome missed deaths that man can endure. We can see another side of God. We can see that he, today he came. It's a different picture that we can see today. We read about it, but now we get to see in person what he is doing. And the crowd missed it when he went in there and they shouted, Hosanna, which means pray, save us. So today, may we not miss it. May we not miss what this day really means. As he went into the city, he actually is coming into our hearts. So today, God wants to step into your heart. He wants to step into your lives. He wants to step into your finances, into your family, into your home, into your bedroom, into your, those places that only sometimes we just don't want anybody to step into. So today, can we just shout inside of us, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your kindness, God. We thank you for that entrance, God, that starts our salvation. So, Father, we just know that you are moving in this place, that you're moving in our lives. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that today, Lord, we just don't miss it. Because we know that the battle has already won. The battle that we could be facing right now, there is already a triumphant entry into our lives. And we know that is because of you. So today, Lord, we just give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise, God, for what you have done. In your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give Jesus and Osana shout. <laughs> amen and amen. Thank you, Faith Assembly. You may be seated. Isn't God good? Isn't God good, isn't he? We love, <clears throat> just love to welcome you every time you are here. If you are watching us online, thank you for letting us into your home. And if you are here for the first time, we'd love to get to know you, get to connect with you. And one of the ways that we do that is through our connect cards that are located right in front of, of your seats. Uh, if you can fill one of those out, and we're going to have an awesome lady by the name of Sandy just give you a buzz and a call or maybe a text and just want to connect with you. But also we want to find out how we can serve you and, um, and tell you everything that's going on here at Faith Assembly during the whole week, not only on Sundays. I'm going to ask the ushers to come down as we receive today's tithes and offerings. And as they do, I do want to remind you that we have three ways to give. One is that how you're doing right now. The other one would be that you come into your office or you can mail it. Or you can go to ivyfaithofsummit.org and you can give through that means as well. Just navigate to donate and you can give there also. So as the ushers are in place, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for everything that will be received today, God. Out of a cheerful heart, of a giving heart, out of an obedient heart. And God, we just know that you 
are the multipliers. So we just pray that you multiply every giving and far beyond just, um, just anything that's been given out of a heart, God, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. A couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Mark, next Friday, or this Friday, should we say, March 29th, is our Good Friday service. It will be from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, we know it might be a working day. It is a working day for a lot of you. Um, so you might be in your lunch hour. So if you can come in at 12 to 1, we're going to be very mindful of that time. And we're also going to be having nursery and um, kids care. And we're also going to be streaming it and just in case you can come that day. So this Friday is our Good Friday service. Try to be here. Also, next Sunday, March 31st, um, you don't want to miss it. It's Easter Sunday service. Invite as many people as you can, and as we remember and celebrate our risen Lord. And there is still time to be baptized. We're going to be having baptisms that day. You can go to the lobby, and you can sign up right there as well. April 19th through the 21st, our youth convention. Sign up uh, your child. You can do that uh, through Pastor Jimmy. He actually is in the back. You can ask him for information there as well. Uh, or if you want to sponsor a child, you can do that also. April 12th is our KidCon. It's a one-day event for kids 6 through 12. It's glow-in-the-dark stuff. Uh, pizza, games, worship is going to be awesome. And Jesus is going to be praised. It's totally free. So please register your child online at ivfaithassembly.org. Or for more details, you can ask Pastor Daisy. And also... Don't forget to stop by the book fair on your way out or pick up your child. Or just after service, there's some um, books there that are being sold. They're awesome. So it's at the Kids Center. Other than that, Pastor Dan. All right. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you on this wonderful Palm Sunday. I would have normally worn a long sleeve shirt today, but because of this one had palm branches on it, I decided to freeze a little bit today in... Uh, in honor of the occasion, we are going to enjoy the uh, world record amount of eggs that we collected. You know, Faith Assembly is so generous. We said, please bring us eggs and bring it filled with candy and toys and little trinkets and things like that. And I know you've heard the number, but we have 5,000 eggs today. And praise the Lord, I think that's worthy. So I know that some of you uh, are here because someone woke up today and said, we have to go to church today, it's, it's the Easter egg hunt. It's like, okay, okay, we'll go, we'll go to church today. And so we're glad to see you, and we will make it worth their while for dragging you to church here today. We'll make it worth their while, and they'll get a bunch of eggs. I want to talk to you today. I want to, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, the Hosanna and Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Uh, I know I say this every time I mention that, but it was really special. Four years ago when Cindy and I were in Jerusalem, we walked on that street, on that place where historians really believe that uh, Jesus came in. And I always think of that. Today, it's uh, opened my eyes, you know, just because now I have this mental image of what it really looked like, and it was quite a beautiful spot. But I want to talk to you today about something a little different from just focusing on Palm Sunday, but we'll get there on Palm Sunday. I want to start out by saying this. Jesus plainly prophesied his death and resurrection there are, I, I don't know how many times, but a bunch of times, and here is just one of them in Matthew 20. Jesus said to the disciples, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. By the way, another total aside, when, when they say we're going up to Jerusalem, you know, when he's in Galilee, you have to go south to go to Jerusalem, and normally you'd say we're going to go down, but Jerusalem was in the mountains, in the top of a mountain, and that is another thing. I got to learn, I knew that, but when I was there, you realize you're up in the mountains. And anyway, here it is again. Jesus came, excuse me, uh, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man, speaking of himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, 
and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised to life. You can't get more specific than that. And he said that numerous times to the disciples. So he knew in advance the suffering. He didn't just say death. He said that they'd be, be mocked and flogged and crucified. And the question that I ask today, that we ask today, is if he knew that he knew that all this awaited him in Jerusalem, why did he still go? And I won't make you wait for what I think the answer is. I believe that even though Jesus knew the horrors and the torture, the gruesomeness, why would he go to Jerusalem? And I believe it's because Jesus knew his purpose in life. He knew why he was born in that manger. He knew why he was here. In Matthew 20, a little later on from that scripture we just read, it said, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus knew he had a purpose, and he knew that purpose was going to include suffering. And uh, that was why he got up in the morning, to fulfill his purpose. Here's another, he said, I didn't come to serve, but to be served and give life as a ransom. And there's another scripture we're all familiar with in John 10.10. 10. Jesus states his purpose like this. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, more to the full. He came to give his life as a ransom so that we could have abundant life. Jesus knew his purpose, and he was willing to pay any price, suffer any consequence, and sacrifice everything to see his purpose fulfilled. Today, I'm hoping that you will be reminded that you too have a purpose, that you have a calling in this life, that you belong to the Lord. And I really believe that the same as we just mentioned about the Lord is when you know your purpose, you will be willing to pay any price, suffer any consequence, and sacrifice everything to see your purpose fulfilled. The other thing, and we're going to focus on this a lot today too, is when you know your purpose in life and when you start serving the Lord and, and acting on that purpose, you're going to get a lot of different reactions from a lot of people. And so I want to give you like four different kinds of groups in your life. And these are reactions that Jesus got in, in, his, in the Holy Week. I mean, got the crown of thorns up here, and it's interesting. I've got a crown of thorns I've heard this many times, so it must be true, that the thorn bush in Israel that grows and that Jesus wore the crown of thorns is only found in one other part of the world, in the whole world, and that is the Imperial Valley. And this is the same kind of thorn bush um, that was made right here. Someone made this for me. Well, well, not for me, but you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> They gave it to me. Here is the first type of person that you're going to encounter when you make a decision to serve the Lord with your whole heart and step into your purpose. The first group is some people will cheer your decision to follow your purpose for your life. It's just such great encouragement when people affirm your decision Mark 11 tells us that when they brought the colt that the disciples had got to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the field, and those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! <clears throat> Blessed is the coming king. 
the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heavens. I mean, there have been people in your life when you told them that you wanted to serve the Lord and you wanted to follow the Lord. They, they, I remember the reaction when I told my mother I, I was, it was, I think I was, I was 11 years old when I got baptized and I told her I wanted to be baptized. And I wanted to formally give my life to the Lord. <clears throat> I think I had already given my life to the Lord, but I mean, my mom basically, she practically started to cry. She was so happy. She just cheered me along. And there are a lot of people that cheers, cheer us along. And Jesus got that. The, you might remember John, the Gospel of John says the reason the people had gathered so many people and all the hosannas was because not very long before that, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead in a town just two miles from there. So, I mean, these people were like, here comes the Messiah. Here comes the, the man that, who raises the dead, the God-man. Some people will cheer your decision. The second kind of person that when you really make a decision to serve the Lord, some well-meaning people will try to talk you out of God's purposes. Have you ever really felt like something was God's will and, and or, you, you know, it's in the Bible and so it's like, I've got to do that. And well-meaning people try to talk you out of it. Peter did this to Jesus. It's, we were laughing about it in our small group my group that meets on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. Love to have you if you don't have a small group in there. But we, we were la literally laughing about this. So, so here, here we set the scene. Jesus is, is prophesying again about, you know, what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And so in Matthew 16, it says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. He said it again. Now, Peter heard this. I, I got to admit, Peter's my favorite. For times like this, Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter comes, <clears throat> maybe comes and puts his arm around Jesus and says, hey, uh, uh, Jesus, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What we were laughing about was I could just see the image of Jesus saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die and this is what's going to happen. And, and Peter coming along and saying, now Jesus, let me explain. Let me explain how it's really going to be. Yes, yes. Peter, why don't you explain this? You know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of arrogant. Some people will try to talk you out of your faith. I'll never forget many years ago, Cindy and I just had one daughter at the time. And, and I don't remember, she was maybe about two years old. We were struggling a little bit financially as you do when you're young and just trying to make ends meet. And we had some relatives come over that had some means and they were really wanting to help us, the young couple, straighten out our finances. And uh, they were looking through our finances and... and uh, and they were saying, what is all this money you give to your church? Now, this is, this is where all the money's going. You, you're giving all this money to your church. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's, that's what we do. That's what Christians do. Well, you're taking the food from your baby's mouth and giving it to your church. You need to stop this right away. And uh, 
You know, and of course it comes with the subtle, if you want our help, then you need to, you need to quit this foolishness. And something just came over me. And I just said, um, this is a biblical mandate and we will not be compromising on a biblical mandate to be tithers and generous givers. And so there is no negotiation when it comes to tithing. And I remember how hard that was to stand up to some folks with some money that wanted to help us out. They were well-meaning. They, they, they really weren't necessarily trying to be, help us to compromise our faith. But they just don't understand. These people that want to cool you off, that want to back you off, why, why can't your kid play on the team? It's because we have church during that workout time. And we are going to be in church on Sunday morning and our kids are not going to be involved in the sport that is a Sunday morning sport. Oh, you're just, that, that's, you're, you're too rigid. These are the same people that are going to always advise you to take the highest salaried position that might be offered to you. They're the ones that will tell you, don't tithe, don't give so much away. Follow your heart, not some difficult to understand will of God. Divorce that jerk. Don't try to work it out with him. You deserve better. You're too nice. Don't humble yourself with that person. Go for the jugular. You, they, they were wrong and you deserve it. They don't appreciate you at that job. You should just quit. Lighten up. Have a little fun. Party with us now and then. These are, these are people in our lives that really do care about us, but they're misguided and they don't understand. It's hard to follow God's will sometimes it's hard to live a life of holiness like we talked about last week. It's hard to not always go along with your friends and family. People don't understand. There's a word in the Bible. Do you know what the word for saints is in the Bible? You know it talks about saints, Christians? The Greek word is agios, and it means holy ones, set apart ones. And so when, when Paul writes to the saints at Ephesus, he's writing to the holy ones, the set apart ones. I'm not sure I've ever said this in a sermon before, but ever since I was young, I felt that I was set apart, not to be more special than anyone, not, not at all. I just have always felt that I was set apart to be holy to the Lord, to be His. Some of you, I think, know exactly what that is because you felt that too. I'm just not like that party crowd, I just don't want to do anything to violate the presence of God in my life. And sometimes, and I'm not trying to gain any sympathy here, because the body of Christ is a wonderful place, but there have been times in my life where I have felt kind of alone, because I am not like the people I work with over here. I'm not like some of these members, the family I'm set apart, I'm different, and it's a lonely road sometimes. It's a narrow road. The crowd doesn't go down that road of being set apart. But church, you are agios. 
You are the holy ones. You are set apart. We are different. We don't live like them. We don't judge them. But we don't live like them. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, the crowd is entering through that that way. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And few find it. And sometimes when you're in a place like this, you're in with a large group of people that all, you know, that all say, amen, we agree, that's right, that's who we are. But sometimes when you're out there and you're in other parts of your life, all of a sudden you realize, I'm not exactly like these folks. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you this story. It was just, it was, it was a strange experience for me. I grew up in the northwest and where I grew up, there were, you know, a lot of Anglo people, a lot of white people. I grew up around a lot of white people. Now, we, we had folks from all over. I remember when we first moved to Los Angeles, um, we decided to visit a church that um, I, I knew the pastor, the pastor's name was Fred Price, and he was kind of famous, and I'd I'd read books or watched sermons or whatever. He was kind of famous. So it was, this, it was uh, the Sunday before we started the pastoral job in North Hollywood. We visited Fred Price's church downtown. There were 10,000 people there. And we wanted to, you know, see a famous minister. And so we went in this massive church. And there were 10,000 people there. And, oh, everyone was so friendly in that church. And they greeted us and we... We uh, came in and sat down, and oh, we felt the presence of the Lord in worship, and then the pastor began to speak, and we were enjoying it so much, and, and all of a sudden, I had this strange feeling, and it, it wasn't a bad feeling, it was just different for me. I looked around at the 10,000 people, and I realized that there weren't 100 white people in the room. And there were over 9,000-something African-American folks in this church. Wonderful church. The day was great. The people were kind. And, you know, there was just something that I'd never experienced before. It was just like, I'm a little bit different. I'm different than this group. We were all one in Christ it was the, the point of telling that story, I'm not even sure it was a great story to tell for this, but, but just that moment where you go, you know, I'm a little different from this, but that was in a good way, and there was all wonderful things in that church. But sometimes in a bad way, like I'm set apart for God's purposes, and a lot of the people that I'm hanging with, they don't really seem to care about that. And you just realize that you're a little different than the people around you. The first group of people, they're cheering you on. Hosanna. Great, man. Serve Jesus. That's awesome. The second group are the people that want to kind of try to cool you off and tone you down and talk you out of doing God's will. The third group that Jesus encountered and that we encounter is you will face resistance from lukewarm compromisers when you're trying to fulfill your purpose of God. I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't sound insulting, but I'm just going to say it. There are a lot of lukewarm compromiser Christians and when you start serving the Lord with your whole heart, they will try to cool you off and, and, and tone you down. Don't get too radical. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove... This, did you know he comes, Jesus comes in, Hosanna, Hosanna. Not too long after this, Jesus goes into the main temple, the temple of Jerusalem. It's the same week. It's the same days. 
Jesus goes into the temple and drove out all who, all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. You know, these people that were selling all these things in, in the temple, I presume they were all Jews because, because by the way, a non-Jew could not gain admittance into the temple court. By the way, the temple court had, it was a huge area. It was, the temple was just this little building in the middle and none of them could approach it. But the, the, the court was a big open area. You had to be a Jew. These were all church people that Jesus went in and he kicked out. These were, these were good Jewish people who'd been selling in the temple. Hey, did you, for, do you, do you need an offering? We have pigeons for sale here. You can, you can get a calf if you'd like to sacrifice a calf. And, and who knows what all they were selling there. And Jesus went in. And he made a whip, and he just like, get out of here. This is the house of God. You made it a den of thieves. And it's the house of prayer. I tell you this. There may be churchgoers, Christians, who resent your zeal and spiritual intensity. Lighten up, man. Have a little fun. We all love the Lord, but you take it too far. The stop excelling, you're making us look bad crowd. You ever had anyone at work telling you, hey, lighten up, you're making us look bad. They'll always resist you. Lukewarm compromisers always want you to cool off so that they feel better about themselves. I'll tell you something. I don't know about you, but I think it's really hard to deal with the disapproval of other people. I know you struggle with it too. The disapproval of other people doesn't necessarily affect us in any way other than you just know they disapprove of us or you or me. But it's hard. You're trying to serve the Lord with your whole heart and somebody might take that opportunity to point out your flaws. Oh, I know you think you're Mr. Holy, but you know what? You, you did this and you say this and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they're right in what they're saying. Yeah, it's true. But what I would say is that is all the more reason why I want to live for the Lord because I did do that and I have said this. I just want to encourage you to stand up, to fight for your calling, to stay red hot in obedience. And I have learned this, that, that, that crowd that's trying to tone you down, when you stand up firm to them, they back off like crazy because now they look bad. And... I've had to stand up numerous times in my life. I haven't always been here in the pulpit. You know, I've, I've been out there and I am out there, but there are just times when you just say, no, I'm not going to compromise. Did you see such and such a movie? It won an Academy Award. No, I didn't see it. Well, why not? Because there's like a couple of like big sex scenes in it and I really don't need, I don't need that. Are you kidding me? You're too holy to know. I, I just don't want that in my eyes. I don't want that in my head three, four days later. I'm still thinking about that. There are just some things that, that, that people don't like when you say. In my last church, I said something that some people thought was so evil they wanted to tar and feather me. I told our worship team that 
being on time to rehearsal was an expression of their integrity. And you would have thought I insulted their mother. Oh, that's so, that's a wow, 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 wow. Really? That's the truth. Being on time is an expression of your integrity. Well, the traffic. Well, I had the same traffic here, and I'm here on time. I'm not, I, I'm not saying these things to try to say we're all Mr. Big and Bad and Miss Goody Two-Shoes and perfect. But when people challenge you and they're trying to tone you down from serving God the way God has called us, we are going to miss out on the victory that God has called us to if we listen to those compromisers and lukewarmers. They want to bring you down. Listen, I am not anybody's judge. But please do not try to tell me to dial it down and to cool off. Now, obviously, like everyone, I'm, I'm not always right. And sometimes there, are, there is appropriate times where, where people might try to speak into my life and say, hey, a little bit, a little strong. It's like, you think so? You know, and there are times, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Jesus had to go in and say, no, this is not what happens in the house of the Lord. You know what's interesting? I don't know why I'm telling you all this, but there are people, not many, that think like I'm the devil. Like Pastor Dan is like the devil. He, I, have had new, I have had at least two people tell me I'm a, I'm a horrible excuse for a pastor. And did you know all the people literally all the people that I'm aware of over the years, and it's a small group, that like hate my guts, did you know that they were all people that I had to hold accountable? That I had to go to and say, hey, please don't speak like that. Please don't act like that. Don't, we, we can't have that here in the church. People are fine until you hold them accountable. Some people, when you hold them accountable, they look at you and say, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I went to a guy who was on our worship team at North Hollywood, and he had slipped back into drugs, and I went to his house about a month after I hadn't seen him, and I just finally just said, hey, man, I hear you're struggling. Yeah, I'm struggling. Come on, what can I do to help you? I believe in you. I believe that you can live a sober life. And that guy, years later, would tell me, I'll never forget when you came to my house and I was, I was back using, and it meant so much and it really helped me get sober. But there are times when you have to hold people accountable and those are the people sometimes that will turn on you. Oh, they're so horrible. He's so judgmental. He's so controlling. But there is a time to stand up and say, this is, as for me and my house, this is how it's going to be in my family. Am I over this little thing? Well, this is how it's going to be in my little area. I don't know about the rest. And some people will hate you for that. And that hatred is painful. There's a fourth group. Jesus dealt with all these people. He dealt with the Hosanna crowd. He dealt with the people that, like Peter, that was trying to talk him out of his calling, but Peter loved him. He gave his life for Jesus. Jesus faced resistance from the from the, from the crowd that was buying and selling, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer, but they turned it into a den of thieves. But there was one more group. Enemies will forcefully come against you. Jesus had enemies. 
Jesus said to the disciples in John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind they hated me first. Some people will hate you because you are a Christian. The chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council in John 11, and they were saying, if we let Jesus go on like this, all men will soon believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place, our temple, and our nation. So from that day forth, they planned to kill the Lord. Enemies. In Mark 15, Pilate is asking the crowd, what then shall we do with the one you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Why should we crucify him? What crime is he committed? Crucify him. There are people in your life that are your enemies. Probably not many. I know there are not many in my life. But fulfilling God's purpose in your life will not be an easy road. And it was not easy for Jesus to walk into Jerusalem when he knew what was waiting for him. Did you know that fulfilling God's purpose in your life will always involve persecution and suffering to some extent? But I tell you, the idea of not fulfilling God's purpose is unacceptable to me. Let me ask you, we've asked, we've said the kind of people that are around our lives, the Hosanna crowd, the tone it down crowd, the lukewarm crowd, and the enemies. But what kind of person are you when other people are trying to find their purpose? Do you cheer on their decision, Hosanna? Do you try to talk them out of it? Well, I don't, I'm not sure. At, uh, I know you're believing for a miracle in your marriage, but, you know, he's kind of a jerk. I don't know if I'd put up with that. Do you resent other people around you who are excelling and, and pounding and, and forcefully moving forward in their faith to the best of their ability? Have you ever made yourself an enemy from someone who's trying to fulfill God's plan? Just a little aside there. But I want to tell you this, even when times are tough, you can totally trust God. Even when you're going to Jerusalem because you know, and you know what's going to happen there, you can still trust God. And that is, that is why Jesus faced his ac accusers. Holy Week teaches us that he knew his calling. Jesus knew his purpose. And his power was found in doing God's will. And so Jesus willingly sacrificed himself. When you find your purpose, you won't let fear stop you. It says in John 18 that Judas came to the garden guided a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons, and Jesus, knowing that all that was going to happen to him, I mean, they come to this group of 12, 12, 11 disciples, Judas wasn't with them, 11 disciples and Jesus, and they don't know which one Jesus is. They didn't have Facebook or TV or anything, and it's like, And so they came out, and Jesus said he went to them. He stepped out, and he went to them. He says, he steps to the front of the group. He wasn't trying to hide in the back. What do you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I am he, Jesus said. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Have you noticed that that's in there? <laughs> I chuckle. Moses says to God, the burning bush, who shall I say sent me? Say, I am sent me. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And they fell to the ground. And it's like, 
Come on, guys. Let's get on. Come on, wake up. Get on with it. I could just see him there. The enemies were on the ground. Is it? Like, Come on. I'll, no, I'm still here. I didn't run off. All right, you ready? Now you can arrest me. He trusted God. <clears throat> Here's the crux of the issue. What's your purpose? We have a lot of purposes in our life and subcallings. For me, I look at some of them. In my life, I think that it was God's calling and a purpose to, to be Cindy's spouse, to be a parent, to be a grandparent. I don't take those things lightly. I think that God called you to be a spouse, a parent, a grandparent for those of you who are. I think God called you to be a certain kind of occupation, to use your talents to discern what your talents are and then just use those to, f- to fulfill your purpose in life in ways that are just a little different from someone else. We all have little significant purposes that might differ one from another when it comes to talents and, and giftings and, and, and focuses like that. But I'll tell you one thing that we all have. The purpose of our life is all the same. I say it every time I preach at a funeral. And I believe that the purpose of your life is this. To know God and to do his will. I think you could boil it all down to just that. Just to know God and to do his will. It has to do with relationship and obedience. The purpose of your life has to do with relationship to God and obedience to Him. This is the meaning of your life. It is the purpose of your life. And Jesus said this sentiment in John 6. He says, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. Jesus said, I didn't come to do my will. I did, I'm here to do the will of the one who sent me. And what do we see? Relationship with the one who sent him and obedience. I came to do his will. Relationship and obedience. Know God and do his will. Sometimes it helps me just to, just to keep things simple. I mean, we've, we've got all this, and it's like, I don't know, but there's so much here, and there's sermons about this and that, and I got this flaw, and I got this gift, and it's just all, it's so hard for me. Here's, here's what it boils down to me, to know God personally and do what he wants with your life. It's the purpose of our life, what Jesus said, to not do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me, which, which puts a whole new light on when somebody, I used to get calls occasionally while I was the pastor here. It's not uncommon for ministers to get these calls. Hi, pastor, we're calling from such and such a church in such and such a town and, you know, a little bigger church than Faith Assembly and And, you know, we were wondering if you might consider being a candidate for, you know, our pastors left, and would you, would you consider, and the first thing that goes through your head is, well, that's a bigger church. I remember one church called me, and it was like, that's a great church in San Diego, on the beach. Would you consider... And before they even finished their spiel, I knew what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And I just said, oh, it's so kind of you to think of me. I just feel really strongly that I'm in mid-calling at Faith Assembly. I really feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. I said that several times over the years to other people. And then when I hit a certain age, I stopped getting those calls. And I wished I would still get the calls even though I would turn them down. But I stopped getting them at some point. When you're in your 60s, you don't get those calls anymore from, uh... but just, 
We measure not by something external. Oh, that would pay more. Oh, that, that would be in a better location. Oh, I would have more responsibility. Oh, this, oh, that. It's like, oh, God, what is your will? And it was like, Dan, you know what my will is. You're in mid-calling at Faith Assembly when I received that call. And I said no on the spot. But that's how we measure our lives. That's how you measure your life. What is God's will for your life? To know him and to do his will. That's what we're all about. The purpose of our lives was the purpose of Jesus. To do the will of him who sent us. Think of your life in terms of that he sent you. He sent you to work at the IID. He sent you to be the parent of that specific child. And some days it's hard to be the parent of a child. As a matter of fact, people have asked, why is it that you and Cindy have such a great marriage? Well, I'll tell you the secret right now. You can write it down if you like. The secret to our marriage has been, at any given time, neither one of us ever wanted to have full custody of our kids. <laughs> and that is why we've just been such a great team. No, we need each other. You want those kids by yourself? No, ma'am, no, sir. <laughs> Forgive me, that is not true, but I don't know why I just wanted to say that. Sometimes you wonder why the Holy Spirit puts up with me. Jesus knowingly did something hard. We've talked about the hard parts. Jesus went to Jerusalem facing hard things, and it started out really good. Hosanna, Hosanna. But it ended with crucify him, crucify him. And by the way, I've said it before, and I'll just say it as an aside. The crowd that was shouting Hosanna did not change. It was a different crowd that was shouting crucify. That's, that's what I think. The, the, they didn't change. But God wants to bless your life. And the pathway to blessing is through the hard times and when you know your purpose and when you know that I am here to do God's will and not my own will, then you will discover your purpose in life and you can go through unimaginable things like what Jesus went through on Good Friday. Just, just coming up. Your purpose is to know God and to do his will. Last week we talked about the knowing God part. We talked about holiness, but not from the, the perspective of I have to do good to please God. It's I want to do good because I love God. Remember last week, holiness and purity was all about relationship, not my goodness. But today, there's an obedience factor. Jesus' example during Holy Week is good for us to fulfill our purposes because sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. And I want to challenge you. Do God's will and fulfill his purpose even when it takes sacrifice. Do his will even when people around you aren't doing his will do his will even when you face opposition. Do his will even when people around you are shouting, Hosanna, you're wonderful. Do his will even when they come after you with swords and clubs. Do his will even if people are shouting, crucify the purpose of your life is to know God and to do his will. Put that in the front of your mind. In some ways, there were a lot of negative examples today about the people that oppose you and, 
and how hard that is. But let me end with the great one. Because Jesus went through all that. He paid the penalty for sin that I was supposed to pay with the death of me and you. And he paid that. And he said, now you can have relationship with the holy God. 2,000 years later, we sit in a church serving the living God and, and feeling the blessing of his love because he was willing to do hard things. And the, way, the reason he could do hard things was because he knew his purpose to have a relationship with God and to do his will. And that is what is in store for us. It is hard. The equivalent of your holy week. But I tell you, God wants to bring you to a place of blessing. And it, it's going to be hard. But it's going to be worth it. <laughs> Everybody wants a gold medal. But not many people want 12 years of pain and working out. Everybody, everybody wants the resurrection, but not many of us want the crucifixion. But that is the pathway. No God and do his will. Keep that in the front of your mind. And the next time something hard is before you, God, this is hard. Help me to do what you want me to do through this because I want my life to be a testimony. God, I pray that the lives of these people would be a testimony to those in their families and their workplaces even strangers that, that meet us, that they would meet you in some beautiful way. Thank you, God, for our purpose. You've given our lives meaning. We're not just here to toil and work and have some good times and, and die, but we are here on purpose for a purpose. Help us remember that. Thank you, Lord. Pray your blessing on each one here today. If you are here and you just have the sense that you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, I want to pray with you. If you're watching online and, and you'd like to pray a prayer to just get yourself right with the Lord, I want to pray with you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I ask this every week, but, but don't take it lightly. You have the opportunity to be in right relationship with the God who made you, the God who created you. If you'd like to pray a prayer with me to receive the Lord, if you're watching online or in person, if you'd like to give your life back to the Lord because you got away from Him, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm going to pray with you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. And you over here. Is there anybody else? God bless you and you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Is there anyone else? Let me just see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand there. It takes courage. And, and there's another hand. It takes some courage, but I mean, this is the God who made you and he's worthy of, of your life. Would you pray with me, those of you that raised your hand and online, those of you that have made a decision to pray this prayer, to ask God to forgive you and to come into your life. Would you all pray this prayer out loud with me so we can reaffirm our love for the Lord Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me for all my sins. I'm sorry that I've not lived for you, but that change is starting today. 
I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. So Lord, I give you my life and I will never take it back. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just feel like something was lifted off of a few people here. Would you stand, please? I'm just excited to be able to pray with you. And if you prayed that prayer with us today, would you grab one of the Connect cards right in front of you in the pew and fill it out and drop it in the bucket on your way out to the uh, Easter egg hunt? If you prayed that prayer online, would you just... uh, Comment below, I prayed with Pastor. Thank you for being here. I showed some self-control today because I wanted to get you guys out of here to, to get out and to, you're going to have to, it's going to take more than one person to carry all the eggs that you're going to be taking home. So may God bless you. If you'd like prayer for anything, you can come down here um, and myself and others will pray for you. Um, Heavenly Father, we just praise you for these wonderful people, that you gave the opportunity to know you, that you gave the opportunity to live a life of obedience that will, that will bring glory to you and blessing in our lives. And so, Lord, we just say, I am yours. I am yours today. That is what we, that is what we end with on this Hosanna Palm Sunday today. We pray your blessing on each one as, as they go and see the excitement of the little ones grabbing those eggs and stuffing them into a basket. We just praise you for your goodness and your blessing in all of our lives. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you as you go.